My name is Mateusz Fałkowski. I'd like to welcome you to the debate, the Polish Constitution of 3rd May. My name is Mateusz Fałkowski, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Pilecki Institute Berlin. This year marks the 230th anniversary of the adoption of the Polish Constitution of 3rd May 1791. In addition to Pilecki Institute, the organizers of this discussion today are Center for Historical Research of the Polish Academy of Science, Berlin, Embassy of the Republic of Poland in Vienna, Polish Institute, Berlin, Leipzig branch, Embassy of the Republic of Lithuania in Vienna, Vienna and the German American Institute, uh, Saxony, and the Embassy of the Republic of Lithuania in Vienna. This event will be simultaneously translated into Polish, German, and English. I would also like to mention that we have a German translation going on of Richard Batterick's essay, The Testament of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And and in a few weeks' time, we will have a further meeting, a discussion with the author. The 18th century has a lot of interesting aspects for our contemporary political culture, not only in Poland, but in all of Europe. In the King's Council in Warsaw on 3rd of May 1791, the same, i.e. the Parliament of the a Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, often subsequently referred to by Poles as the First Republic, passed a law that is generally regarded as the first modern constitution in Europe. We meet today on 5th of May, and this date can also be perceived as legitimate in fact, the originally planned date of the Constitution was 5th of May, 1791. And the proponents of the Constitution at the time tactically moved the date of the document's del deliberations forward by two days, so that opponents would not have time to return from the Easter recess. We are all back from the Easter holidays by now, and I am very pleased to welcome and introduce the participants in the discussion. Professor Yolanta Hoinska-Mika is a historian at the University of Warsaw and works on the history of parliamentarism from the 16th century onwards. Professor Patitz Dombrovsky is a historian associate at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, director at the Polish Institute of Arts and Science in America, and editor of H Poland website. She is also the author of Poland, uh, the first thousand years. Dr. Carsten Holster is a historian at the Martin Luther University, Halle Wittenberg, and works on modern history of Poland. Alvidas Nikšentaitis is a historian at the Lithuanian Historical Institute in Vilnius and works on the history of Lithuania. Piotr, Professor Piotr Ugniewski is a historian at the University of Warsaw and studies Poland and France in the 18th century. The discussion will be moderated by Professor Igor, Igor Kukulewski. Igor is a historian who studies the history of Poland and Europe from the 16th to the 18th century and director of the Center for Historical Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Berlin. Professor Nick Gentaitis could not be present today, so we have recorded his commentary. So now we will start with Lithuanian perspective on the constitution, and then Igor Kokolevsky and the other participants will be able to speak. These days, Lithuania and Poland are celebrating a special anniversary. It's 230 years of the constitution of 3rd of May. 
it was not an easy question for Lithuania. So it, it was a question discussed in Lithuania whether to remember or not. But after all, it was decided that it is an important event and it should be remembered. It has a historical significance. And I would like to talk about two things in this constitution. The first, we all know that history cannot be repeated, but we learn from history. The first lesson is regarding the history of the constitution is the way that it is tried to reach sovereignty of the state. You have to keep in mind that the 18th century was no easy time, no easy period. The state was under threat. And as we now know, it was during its last month, the last month of the Polish-Lithuanian state. The uh, constitution was passed and it was a very special uh, text which mentioned that only free people, free citizens, citizens with democratic liberties were able to defend the nation. That is an interesting thought that nobody should Egan should be ignored. And this is, it's an important lesson for today's politics too. A second important aspect for me is the Lithuanian perspective. Really, the relations between Poland and Lithuania between the 14th and the 18th century, one term fits very well I would say it, it is a culture of relations, which is very much characterized by compromise. The constitution and other further accompanying acts confirm that. So the Polish-Lithuanian relations were very much strengthened. And the constitution should strengthen the nation, but they did not forget that actually um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a dual monarchy. So on the 20th of October, a new act was passed on the relations between Poland and Lithuania, these two parts of a dual monarchy. So this pact, this act, uh, saw to an equal division of powers between both. So we can say that the remembrance of the constitution of the 3rd of May in Poland and Lithuania is important because it shows us how to use a compromise. How can we, talking about different cultures uh, as Lithuania and Poland were at the time, how can we live in these different cultures? So it is important to remember that. Sorry, the sound is extremely bad. So the remembrance of the, if we remember the constitution of 3rd of May in Poland and Lithuania, we also have to keep in mind Lithuanian stereotypes on Poland. We have to consider those because some of them still exist to this very day. And not all of these stereotypes were created in the 18th century, but 
uh, during the 20th century. Different from the 14th to the 18th century, in the 20th century, we had a very complicated history. We lost our historical capital, Wilna. Uh, it was almost a state of war in, in that interwar period. And that led to the stereotype that you can't believe the Poles. And this has cast a shadow on the historic relations between the two countries. On the 3rd of May, for a long time, was not mentioned a lot because it really, it was disturbing the relations with Poland. Only the slow improvement of those relations, end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century has cast a new light on the constitution. In 2007, in Lithuania, there was a discussion on how to deal with the topic of that constitution. The reason was the decision to make the 3rd of May a national um, day of remembrance in Lithuania. So this project, this draft was presented eight times in parliament until it finally passed. So, this discussion, however, was also very important because the Lithuanian uh, society and population now has more information on the constitution of the 3rd of May. And nowadays, It is very linked very closely to another um, act that was approved. So that was on the 20th of October when the decision on the equality of both parts of the dual monarchy was um, reinstalled. So this year we're going to have celebrations on the constitution of 3rd of May all year long, not just now in spring, but also in autumn. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to apologize for the bad audio quality of this recording. We will work on it to improve it. The commentary by Professor Nichentaitis will also be made available in written form. And uh, our discussion today will, of course, also be online via YouTube. So, and we're going to try and provide a written version of Professor Nixentaitis' commentary. We have just heard from Professor Nichentaitis that two nations and states contributed to the creation of the constitution of the 3rd of May. The mutual um, guarantee of both nations on the 20th October 1791, two states contributed to that. 
It was the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which since 1569 formed a common Polish-Lithuanian Union state. Commonwealth, this so-called Polish-Lithuanian noble republic of the two nations was indeed a multi-ethnic empire inhabited not only by Poles and Lithuanians, but also by Belarusians, Ukrainians, as well as numerous Jews, Germans, Armenians, Tatars, and other ethnic groups. Moreover, the contents of the constitution of the 3rd of May, 1791, were largely influenced by ideas of the French, British, as well as the uh, US American Enlightenment. Let us begin our panel discussion with an extensive quote from a German John journalist and admirer of the French Enlightenment, Wilhelm Ludwig Wecklin, who wrote in his article about the comparison between the Polish constitution and the French uh, from 1791, and I quote, both peoples want to pass from the strictest aristocracy under which they languished to moderate monarchy. The French constitution is an original. The Polish one, on the other hand, is a mishmash of the English, American, New Franconian, and old Polish ones. The focal point of the latter, i.e. the Polish constitution, is the transformation of the elective scepter into the heret hereditary one. The former, i.e. the French one, seems to want to culminate in the hereditarization of the people's rights and the social contract. The latter, i.e. the French one, is a work of deliberation and the action of human reason. The latter, i.e. the Polish constitution, is a work of necessity. The French one sprang from a plan, the Polish one from chance. End of quote. To what extent would the participants in today's panel discussion, who are proven experts in the field of the comparative history of Poland, France, and the USA, share this opinion? With this question, I like to address in Polish, because we're going to continue in Polish, First, Professor Jolanta Jowiska Mika. Viola, uh, to what extent did the 3rd of May Constitution follow from the political traditions of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth? Uh, to what extent did those practices, the political practices of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, lead to its adoption? This is a very important question, essentially two questions. And the answer is by no means simple. We have to keep in mind that for many years, the constitution of May 3rd, the basic law was presented as a remedy to all of the problems of the old system. So it was set as a counter example to the previous system of the ancestors. But we have to make some disclaimers. In the 18th century, especially in the second half of the 18th century, political practice was merely a kind of facade. And it was a far stretch from the monarchy that the ancestors had set up in the late Jagiellonian period. It was um, quite a, a long way away from the mixed monarchy, which combined harmoniously the strong power of the monarch, uh, the aristocracy as 
represented by the Senate and by the general uh, population. The late Jagiellonian monarchy was a community of citizens, um, citizens who shared rights and obligations. Now let's travel to the times that we are discussing today. It isn't just a facade, actually. The picture is much sadder because we are dealing with a nation that is not sovereign and everything is essentially uh, essentially being dictated by the Russian Empire. So it's hardly surprising that the constitution, which was the outcome of a kind of patriotic rising, um, that we see it as a kind of return to the old times. But when we look at the circumstances in which the constitution was adopted, and if we read the text carefully, uh, we will see that this break was not obvious. There was quite a lot, both in the constitution and in the discussions around it. Um, there were quite a few elements of the tradition. Let us also keep in mind that the constitution is was a work created by the parliament, by the same, for many decades, the same was seen as the sole remedy to all of the troubles of the Commonwealth. In the second half of the 18th century, one of these ailings or troubles is the weak government. And everyone realized this. If we look at what happened after the first partition of Poland, as historians note, we see an activation and quick political maturation of the middle nobility. Um, although I am a scholar of earlier periods, this has some analogies to the executionary movement of the 16th century, which was also driven by the middle nobility. And as scholars today note, uh, the middle nobility returns as a political agent. Uh, this was noted by Professor Kravich, who um, mentions that after the lost bar confederation, something began changing in the political consciousness of the middle nobility. And when the, uh, the, the great same uh, begins its deliberations, one of the first things that they do, of course, after they um, cancel the uh, constant council and adopt some laws on the army, what happens? They set up a special collegiate body, which is supposed to propose reforms uh, through the deputation as to the form of government. From our current standpoint, uh, the outcomes of this effort are, weren't very impressive, but at the same time, we see an incredible unprecedented um, empowerment or activation of public opinion, of public discussions um, going on in hundreds of, um, um, of leaflets, um, in periodicals, in texts, um, on almost any matter. And the discussion is essentially about how to fix the government. The citizens um, have a long tradition of discussion and deliberation of coming uh, to their positions, of defending their positions. And they feel responsible for shaping the future of uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So the discussion both in the same and outside of the same, this intellectual um, arousal, you could say, is a reference to the best traditions, the best civic traditions of the old uh, Polish Republic. Uh, secondly, and we will return to this point, although uh, the 3rd of May constitution was adopted in an extraordinary way, uh, mm, Two weeks, it was preceded two weeks earlier by the law on cities. 
of which uh, the late historian Lukasz Kondiela saw as one of the most important reforms of the four years same. Uh, that was um, adopted um, in an ordinary procedure without recourse to extraordinary measures. And this law on cities was also included in the 3rd of May Constitution. Next, let us also remember that the text of the Constitution, and this also is very important, the text was adopted by a claim on May 5th by the deputation uh, the constitutional deputation. So again, it was um, it was legalized. And one of the uh, forms of social support given to the constitution were the decisions of the diatines uh, taken, made in February of the following year. Uh, the whole diatine campaign, which scholars also refer to as the February referendum. And one final thing, because I don't want to um, uh, take up too much time. Uh, we speak quite a lot of certain conceptual categories which appear in the Constitution. Uh, for example, uh, the notion of the nation. And here we are dealing with a broader definition. Broader than the regular concept. Uh, um, and here the nation also includes uh, the bourgeoisie, um, and perhaps also the peasantry, although scholars uh, differ on this point. Uh, the problem of peasant land ownership also appears in the constitution to the extent that it could appear under those circumstances. Another important point is that the constitution emphasizes the fact that everything that is being decided comes from the will of the people. So how was uh, the people understood? How was law understood? What did it mean to say that the decisions were made on behalf of the entire nation, that the constitution came from the will of the people? Uh, before the nation um, only included uh, the nobility, but not so anymore. Uh, so one final point, we have to keep in mind that the constitution did not demolish the existing political system. It, it wasn't a break. It simply introduced some correction uh, so that Poland could obtain a more effective government, but all of the institutions remained the same. However, uh, corrections were made so as to make the system more effective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I would like to address Professor Ugnowski. To what extent do you agree with your full speaker and uh, to what extent do you agree with Verklin's critical assessment that uh, the May the third constitution was in comparison with the French constitution of uh, September the 3rd, uh, 1791, was hardly an original product. Uh, what were the differences and similarities between uh, these two first modern European constitutions, in your opinion? Well, it is indeed hard for me to share this point of view stemming from Germany the point of view stating that our constitution, the Polish constitution, was indeed, indeed a little original. As we heard uh, from my colleague, uh, Madam Hoinska Mika, my full speaker, our domestic inspirations were vital when it comes to creating a, such an act of law. However, when it comes to foreign impact, uh, it was present indeed, but that does not mean that our constitution, our governmental act was a copy or 
a repetition of some foreign active law. Quite on the contrary, I think it was an original product uh, that uh, combined some domestic elements with some foreign ones. Actually, I would uh, start uh, with uh, Stanislas Augustus, the Polish king, who, from my perspective, is uh, a key persona in that context. Our king would emphasize that the uh, 3rd of May constitution was actually following the pattern of uh, um, the, U the United Kingdom. It, he did not uh, admit that there was any French influence, and in particular, he did not uh, speak of the French constitution. In fact, as we know, it had been passed in September 1791, yet back uh, in the days everybody uh, knew that the General uh, Assembly um, had been working on it already beforehand. Why didn't he um, speak openly about the, the correlation between Poland and France. In fact, the French uh, Revolution had uh, an aspect of being a social um, revolution, uh, disrupting the continuity of Ancien Regime. Even though uh, it was still not yet fully shaped that it included elements of uh, political violence and uh, first victims uh, um, had to be sacrificed. Um, the language of political debate uh, was uh, uh, full of violent notions. Uh, any associations related to the church were causing trouble back in the days in France. Uh, the situation was a really um, severe and uh, the, the, the clash between the church and the state uh, was severe. It was not as severe in Poland. Uh, however, there were some shifts in this respect. Uh, King um, cared a lot to ensure that uh, outside of the Polish borders, there would be no mention of the fact that the passing of the constitution was a kind of coup d'etat, uh, was a, a result of some conspiracy with or without his participation, a conspiracy in general. The point is was to uh, present our revolution as so-called mild revolution, i.e. in contrast with uh, um, the violent uh, revolution in France. Uh, you, you might find it uh, funny that the king was really concerned to when uh, uh, he heard from foreign press that uh, supposedly at 3 a.m. before the parliamentary uh, session, in the middle of the night, there was some clandestine meeting in the rooms uh, uh, of uh, the king. Uh, he was really concerned with that uh, piece of information. It was, of course, not true. However, it is indeed telling that he was uh, really adamant about avoiding such publicity abroad. I started from the king because I think that the king's role in uh, the shaping of the constitution was a bit different. He was one of the most important authors of it, not the only one, however, a key player, and I myself am an advocate of the king, and in my opinion, he was the most important author of the constitution. Other people, however, also played a role there, the leader of the back then opposition, counter Ignacy Potocki was also vital in this context. Why am I mentioning that? Well, in France, the situation was totally different when it came to uh, the monarch. Uh, Louis XVI uh, was hardly an author of uh, the uh, September Constitution. 
the French uh, constitution uh, gave foundations uh, to the constitutional monarchy, and it was um, shaped by a certain group of politicians uh, whose nature was monarchist. However, the role of uh, Louis the Sixteenth was uh, indirect. He was not the one holding uh, the pen in his hand, unlike our king. You might also venture out uh, to take a different perspective uh, on the Polish question and look at it uh, uh, through the eyes of the French themselves. Let me quote Article 16 from the Declaration of uh, uh, the uh, Rights of uh, um, Citizens. Uh, it uh, says that uh, a society where there is uh, no safeguard of uh, rights and uh, a division of powers has no constitution. Well, in this light, From the French perspective, our constitution, the Polish constitution, was a constitution indeed. In the light of the definition from the Declaration of the uh, Rights of uh, Man and of the Citizen, it was a constitution. Why? Well, starting from the positive uh, context, the text of the Polish constitution, much shorter than the vast text of the French one, was beautifully written, yet laconic in nature. It was ordered along the classical Montesquieu's division of power. This may be a sign of the French um, impact. Uh, however, this is the French Enlightenment and not the draft French constitution from uh, 1791. It is in this respect that uh, our, our constitution meets the prerequisites in uh, of Article 16. However, uh, it's a bit uh, different when we speak of uh, um, guarantees or safeguards of the rights. For instance, uh, equality of all citizens uh, in France. Uh, Back uh, in uh, 1791, or even earlier, equality, absolute equality of uh, all Frenchmen before the uh, law was present, there were no division of states, no aristocratic titles, uh, no medals. Uh, crafts associations and all symbols uh, such as uh, the coats of arms were had been eliminated. Equality was uh, omnipresent. Uh, in the constitution of the 3rd of May, uh, that was not the case in Poland. Uh, we retained uh, the uh, system of uh, social classes, so-called states, after the 3rd of May. However, it must be said that my fourth speaker already mentioned uh, the law on cities and uh, in the light of that document, uh, many rights of the nobility were vested also uh, with uh, the bourgeoisie an old 15th century uh, privilege included that uh, gave uh, the nobility immunity. From that point onward, also the bourgeoisie uh, was able to enjoy that right. However, there is a big difference between the Polish and the French constitution. Namely, the scope of political rights. In France, the French constitution created the category of so-called active citizens. They had the right uh, 
to vote and uh, could be voted uh, for us can as future candidates uh, to the um, general assembly so they had uh, active and passive voting right and voting right was vested with people who were paying taxes equal to free day rates as a marginal note i would like to remark that uh, free day rates uh, was rather a blurred notion however it was to set a third certain threshold as for personal wealth the threshold was, pr was pretty low and it was not dependent on social classes as, as their social classes had been abolished the personal situation of such a person uh, could not be that of dependency these could not be servants, for instance. And of course, voting rights were not given to women. In Poland, uh, the law on cities, the law on uh, the parliament and the constitution of the 3rd of May laid the foundations for a new definition of the group that was enjoying political rights. It included only noblemen who had any kind of land Furthermore, they had a very uh, limited uh, uh, right to participate in uh, the deliberations of uh, the, the same. Uh, and this right was uh, vested in so-called plenipotentiaries of towns and cities, which was a very narrow uh, group. Uh, in France, there were around 15% of active citizens of the entire male population or population in general, if I can correct myself. In Poland, nobody did any calculations. Perhaps it would be worth doing that. It might be uh, my um, research, please. However, bearing in mind the fact that the number of uh, noblemen with the right uh, to vote uh, decreased and was uh, dependent um, on um, owning land, And um, adding to that the fact that uh, this right was vested with uh, the educated bourgeoisie, I would say that we might be hovering around 5%. Of course, this is a rough estimate. Yet what I mean to say is that it was a much, much uh, lower percentage. When it comes to other rights, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, the Declaration um, of the Rights of Men and of the Citizens speaks of uh, uh, human civil rights there is another uh, right uh, a, a right that is uh, guaranteed by the french uh, constitution which is not uh, present uh, in the polish constitution namely um, the right to own back in the days it was the right of the nobleman only However, it is um, hard to speak of uh, uh, peasants, uh, feudal peasants who did not own anything. They had no property, uh, hence it would be hard for them to have anything of sort of property uh, guaranteed in the constitution. I am reminded that I have to uh, finish. Uh, this is the role of a moderator, indeed. Well, I will therefore skip my uh, comparisons and just give you a word of summary. Despite everything, it has to be emphasized that uh, in order to defend the legacy of uh, our Polish constitution, the revolutionary nature of it uh, was about changing the political institutions because this was the most urgent matter. It was honored that the existence of the state depended on. And it um, was honored that the uh, future of uh, Poland after the partitions depended on. That's why the social part was uh, limited, was uh, um, 
not given priority simply um, to ensure support for the changes in the political sphere. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you. I just wanted to, to uh, excuse myself. Uh, uh, Wilhelm Ludwig Werklin's uh, critical opinion of the Polish constitution was definitely a, vo a voice of the minority uh, when it comes to German public opinion. As you rightly pointed out, when it comes, uh, when you spoke about uh, foreign opinions about what was happening in Poland, the Germans were rather enthusiastic. They juxtaposed the bloody French uh, uh, revolution with the one that happened in Poland and what was actually bloodless. However, let's follow the Verklin's critical opinion. Indeed, it should have uh, um, caused some controversy. And let's turn to Professor Patrice Dombrowski. Uh, Professor uh, Dombrowski, to what extent uh, do you share Verklin's opinion and to what extent did the Polish constitution of May 3rd uh, draw on the American constitution of Yes, 87. Well, let me begin by thanking the organizers of this discussion for inviting me to participate. And I should caution that I am not an early modern or constitutional historian, although I do know a thing or two about the Polish past. So my duty here is to talk about the first two constitutions in the world, the American Constitution of September 17th, 1787, and the Polish Constitution of the 3rd of May, 1791. Before comparing these two documents and talking a bit about the Anglo-American connection, let me say from the outset that there are a number of points of comparison. The American founding fathers reached back to antiquity, in particular to the period of the Roman Republic for inspiration. That meant that there were already some similarities with Polish republicanism, which was the starting place for the 3rd of May reformers. The tradition of placing limits on the exercise of power and the protection of individual rights and privileges was already there. Now, in the period leading up to the framing of the two constitutions, both Americans and Poles look to British political traditions and ideas, if partaking variously of them. The Paul Hugo Kowontai saw the unwritten English constitution as a model combining, I quote, the authority of the crown and the personal impact of the king on the government with the parliamentary system and the protection of the citizen's freedom. And there was also some interesting Polish-English cross-pollination. The British political thinker Algernon Sidney had been influenced by the 16th century Polish thinker Wawrzyniec Goślicki, in Latin Goślicius, the author of De Optimo Senatore Libri Duo, or On the Perfect Senator, two books. And Poles conversely liked Henry Bolingbroke's idea presented in his work, the idea of a patriot king, of a patriarchal monarch whose throne was hereditary, but whose power was limited. And of course, both Poles and Americans had some idea of what was happening on the other side of the Atlantic. The Polish reformers were following the struggle of the American colonists for independence, and they knew what Benjamin Franklin and George Washington were doing that is, they were creating a republic in America. And Americans founding fathers also knew something of what had happened to Poland, having been informed by Poles in America, such as the heroes of two continents, Kazimierz Pułaski and Tadeusz Kościuszko. However, all these comparisons aside, the countries were in different situations. The American Constitution was intended to help with the consolidation of power. It was written, and here I quote the preamble to the Constitution, in order to form a more perfect union, 
the union to be perfected was the one established a decade earlier by the de Declaration of Independence of July 4th, 1776, and formulated, if imperfectly, in the subsequent Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. In America, the 4th of July is the date we celebrate as a national holiday. By contrast, what the Polish constitution of the 3rd of May, 1791 represented was truly reformist. And here I think I'm repeating what some of the other participants have already said. I would like to counter the words of Werklin by introducing into the discussion some other foreigners assessments. Here witness the alarmed reaction to the constitution of Prussian minister Ewald Friedrich von Herzberg. I quote, the Poles have dealt a fatal blow to the Prussian monarchy by bringing in a hereditary throne and a constitution better than England's. Sooner or later, Poland will take West and perhaps even East Prussia from us. How can we, exposed from Teschen to Mammel, defend ourselves against a populous and well-ruled nation? Uh, the conservative Edmund Burke praised the Constitution as the most pure public good which ever has been conferred on mankind. And one did not have to be a conservative to see the Constitution in a positive light. Karl Marx later wrote, Despite its shortcomings, this Constitution looms up against the background of Rousseau, Prusso, Austrian barbarism as the only work of liberty which Eastern Europe has ever created independently. And it emerged exclusively from the privileged class, from the nobility. The history of the world has never seen another example of such nobility of the nobility. So the Commonwealth may have been truncated, but it was also transformed. The framers of the Polish constitution sought to reform an extant polity of long duration to transform the historic noble republic into a constitutional monarchy. And indeed, when we compare the Polish and American cases, Poles had the harder task being surrounded by absolutist monarchies who preferred that the Commonwealth remain weak or not exist at all, which is what we know ultimately happened. Uh, Americans had already fought and won their war. But let's continue by considering some of the similarities between the two first constitutions. Both were founded upon the idea of popular government based on will of the people or the will of the nation. Nation being in Polish the word narod. And I would add here that it's rather ambiguously used in the constitution. It could mean people, it could mean the noble nation, it could be the nation of property owners. It was ambiguous. At any rate, the American preamble begins, we the people of the United States do ordain and establish this constitution. Uh, although the Polish preamble has some of the same wording in it, it also begins with God and King, so it's slightly different. However, Article 5 of the Constitution states that, I quote, all power in the human community takes its origin in the will of the nation, again, or will of the people, however you want to translate that. And as has already been mentioned by uh, Professor Hoinska Mikal, the Polish Constitution was gently redefining the nation, which until that time had been the purview of the nobility, some eight to 10% of the population. Article four on the peasantry claims that the agricultural folk constitute the most numerous populace in the nation. And as was also been mentioned by both professors preceding me, uh, provisions were made for the gradual ennoblement of burghers. At the same time, the noble nation was being transformed into that nation of property owners, 
This meant that the poorest of nobles were no longer qualified to be active citizens, as Professor Ugniewski underscored. Now, lest you think that only the Poles with their nation of nobles were exclusive, in the United States, there was also originally a division into politically active voters and passive non-voters with qualifications for voters left to the individual states. This meant that an estimated one fifth of adult white males had no vote. Now, another important similarity between the two documents is that they underscore underscore the separation of powers. In the US Constitution, this is laid out in articles one, two, and three on the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of the government. The very important for the comparison, article five of the Polish Constitution goes ahead and proclaims as much. It, I quote, says, three powers should and on the basis of this law will always constitute the government of the Polish nation. They are legislative power vested in the assembled estates, the highest executive power vested in the king and the council of guardians, and the judicial power vested in the court set for this purpose on which, or which are going to be set. Of course, there are some fine distinctions between the two. In the American case, we speak generally of uh, a system of checks and balances being put into place, while in the Polish case, the separation of powers was to balance the excessive freedom of the big magnates, which has been emphasized by my previous speakers, and to strengthen the authority of the king, although of course he never rises up to the level of the legislative branch, which is another bit of the history of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. I think I will end my answer with that. <laughs> Bardzo dziękujemy Pani Profesor, dziękujemy na zwrócenie uwagi w również na... Thank you, Madam Professor. Thank you for pointing out to us that in the American Constitution, only part of the society was granted political rights, uh, as was uh, pointed out by Howard Zims in his uh, book. Uh, just like you are um, stated, uh, he would also emphasize the fact that there were no rights granted to uh, people of Afro-American origin in the American constitution and to people of Indian origin, that is, uh, Native Americans. Uh, as for Professor Ugniewski, well, I would like to draw your attention to a similar uh, issue, namely slavery. To what extent uh, slaves, which were such a numerous uh, group in the French colonies, uh, happened to be included in the uh, constitution? Well, they did not happen to be included there. That's a, a short and simple answer. It was only uh, during the uh, Grand uh, Terror of 1794 um, that uh, they were actually noticed and uh, when slavery was abolished for a short period of time. However, uh, it was in 1802 that uh, the Napoleon brought it back and only in 1848 was slavery fully abolished in France. Uh, however, let's move on to my dear friend, a German who is at the same uh, time uh, a, citizen, uh, um, a citizen of Saxony. That's why my question to you, uh, let's get back to uh, Vaglin. He would say that the key element of the constitution of the 3rd of May was uh, to uh, turn the monarchy uh, to a hereditary one you know, from um, the principle, replacing the principle of a free election with a hereditary monarchy. The throne was to be uh, inherited uh, by uh, the Vettin uh, dynasty from uh, Saxony. Why did the authors of the May constitution want to transfer the throne to the Saxon uh, Vettin uh, dynasty? Personally, I don't think that it enjoyed such a great reputation in Poland back then. Uh, uh, 
after the uh, Polish Saxon un Union came to an end. Carsten? So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this discussion, and thank you very much for the interesting question. At first glance, it seems to be easy to answer. After all, there are lots of uh, contemporary uh, documents, published documents, talking about the decision uh, for the hereditary throne uh, given to the Saxon dynasty and justifying that decision, justifying it not lastly be because it was necessary for Poland's independence and for the sovereignty of the nation. Taking a closer look, it becomes more complicated, however. After all, the decision to grant the nobles, to take away the right of the nobles to elect the king, king was the most controversial deliberation of the uh, provision of the constitution, we can safely assume that during a regular session of the same, it would never have passed. And it's that is exactly the reason why they had to um, take this um, procedure on 3rd of May, which is similar to a, a, a coup, really. On the other hand, this provision has to do with the Confederation, confederation of Targowice, and it seemed to give uh, that confederation a justification to use military force against the constitution. If you take a closer look at the debates of the time, through modern lenses, three questions arise. The first is that from today's point of view, however, that if you want to have a, a liberal constitution, why have a king at all? So second is, well, if you need to have a king and you had a, an elective monarchy, why do you need a hereditary monarchy now? And third question is, why precisely Frederick Augustus of Saxonia? As I said, the Saxonian monarchy in, in Poland, the personal union of the um, crown of Saxony and, and Poland has not been shown in a very positive light in history. So I'm going to talk very briefly on these three points. Let's start with the question, why not a purely republican Poland, Polish state? We can say that this was never seriously uh, considered at the time, but the republican fraction in the same with their wish for a very strong restriction of the powers of the king came quite close to this idea, however. Uh, if there was such a strong resistance, which is shown from published works of the time, the reason was that if there is no strong king, the next strongest uh, people, i.e. the magnates, the pow most powerful nobles, would become even more powerful, which was not at all in the interest of the middling nobles that wanted to rise up socially, and not in the interest of the uh, citizens, the burghers of the towns either. In addition, such a system would weaken the central power because it would involve a stronger decentralization. And this was also entirely against the interests of the majority of the estates um, assembled in the same. And I might add that the idea we might have today that a Republican um, constitution from a grassroots constitution, so to speak, was not part of the way of thinking of all political um, participants at the time. However, only a few years later, during the Jushko uprise in 94, this model was not so far-fetched either. But around 1790, 1790, it was about hereditary monarchy or elective monarchy. It is interesting to take a closer look. Those who spoke for turning to a hereditary monarchy said that the um, division of powers between the king, the strongest noble families, and the other interest groups 
the king could only exercise his authority over those groups if he had a strong authority, and he would only get that authority if the dynasty would become hereditary. The weakness of the king through the elective monarchy in their opinion, led to the king being much too easy to influence and much too weak against uh, the interests of those strong, powerful groups. Only in a hereditary monarchy, they claimed, the destiny of his family would be linked to the destiny of the nation. Only then would the king be able to rule longer than his own lifetime. Only in a hereditary monarchy, the neighboring monarchs would see the uh, Polish monarch, monarch as an equal. So he would have a quite a different position in the entire surrounding system. And the, um, propose, uh, the promoters of a hereditary monarchy said that all the fears that had existed for more than 100 years that um, such a monarchy would lead to the absolute power of the monarch, those fears were exaggerated because the legislation had uh, given very clear boundaries to that power. And the main argument, finally, was that it was history. All elections, all royal elections since the end of the 17th century had led to the intrusion of foreign powers and um, before long to civil unrest. And they wanted to avoid this. And they also wanted to prevent the <clears throat> aspiration of neighboring powers to prepare to present their own candidates for king's royal elections. And especially the time after the death of a king until the time of the new election and the difficulties linked to such an interregnum uh, should be eliminated by making the monarchy hereditary. The opponents of such a change, those who were for keeping the elective monarchy, had strong arguments too, because they could say that what kind of liberty is, is it if you have a king you can, cannot elect? That would be a step back, not a step forward with the constitution. Also, only a king who um, had to make sure to uh, have a successor elected from their family. Only such a king would be interested in the good of the nation, not only in promoting his family. And finally, uh, pointing out, they were pointing out that the neighboring states would never tolerate a um, hereditary succession. And regarding the power of the king, they could point out that the boundaries of that power were not so strong. Yes, the same, the parliament and the envoys were able to control everything. They could uh, take the min make the ministers responsible. However, the king still had the right to, nom to nominate um, uh, all the senators and all the other offices. That meant that more than 50% of the body that was to control the, the king was nominated by the king himself, actually. In addition, there were his financial opportunities and his position in the military. So he would not be so weak as a king according to the constitution as it had been already been planned when the discussion of the hereditary monarchy started. And the main argument of those who spoke for the hereditary monarchy and the opponents of the change, however, said that also in hereditary monarchies, often they were wars on successions. Many of the wars of the 18th century, indeed, were wars of succession to the throne. And they could also point out that you could change the mode of election instead of doing away with elections entirely. So when the discussions in the same in the autumn of 1790, both fractions had very hardened positions. They kept repeating their arguments. 
until someone pro made a proposal saying that you could uh, postpone the discussion and first um, discuss whether they might elect now a successor to the actual king. This led to general uh, acclaim, and when the king agreed to, everybody was kissing his hand gratefully, only to continue the um, uh, this the controversial discussion on hereditary success, succession or not, until another single uh, parliamentarian said, well, the discussion is kind of difficult, but we could uh, talk about making King August of Saxony, elect him to be the successor, successor of the present king. And this found general agreement. And the question was put to the uh, same, the um, rural parliaments, the district parliaments. And now we're at the question, why a Saxon monarchy? The, the Sejmiki, uh, the regional parliaments agreed with an overwhelming majority to elect um, August from of Saxony to be the future king. This can be uh, based on the fact that the contemporary, uh, contemporaries had a very a positive um, recollection of the of Saxony and, and the Saxon reign. Looking at the contemporary uh, literature of the time, you can find lots of arguments why actually the Saxon monarchy was better and only the opposition were, it was only the opposition's fault that it did not succeed in the end. In addition, the Jagil Jagiellonian um, heritage of the Saxon of Saxony's dynasty could be pointed out. Successful reign of Frederick Augustus in Saxony, who had been able to restore the country after the Seven Years' War in the thirty years of his reign, and they were prosperous again now. And he also spoke a bit of Polish. Polish. And there were no significant other candidates to um, decide on. And the problem, however, was nobody had asked Frederick August if he actually wanted to be king. And nobody asked him after the decision had been more or less taken that he was the only candidate. So Frederick August could only be uh, only convey in unoffici officially through his envoy in Warsaw that he would only agree if the other powers would agree to, and if it was a to be a hereditary succession to the throne. So this was a contradiction to the decision by the Seimiki they had instructed their envoys that the free election of the king had to be maintained. At the same time, the foreign, um, the foreign situation abroad changed, um, that they were even able to discuss uh, on the, the, the constitution for such a long time without um, a foreign um, intrusion. The reason was that Austria and Russia had been involved in a um, long war, which was now approaching its end. At the same time, Prussia was trying to become closer to Austria again, and the Prussian-Polish alliance was losing in importance. So time um, was short. And in this situation, a small group around the king, with the king, wrote that passage uh, that um, um, included the um, hereditary succession of the Wettin um, dynasty in Poland and also enabled the uh, succession of the husband of the daughters. One can could say that this decision of a small group that ended up in the constitution of 3rd of May, that 
it was only included because the constitution uh, was um, approved in the absence of a large part of the parliamentarians and only by acclamation. So if they were hoping to implement this um, rule on hereditary succession, if they had some hope, it was because Frederick August did not even have a son, only a daughter. And it opened up a kind of possibility that this daughter might marry a Prussian or Austrian prince. So through the back door, they might be able to forge an alliance with one of the large powers, the neighboring powers. So that was their hope not to encounter a decisive opposition of all powers neighboring Poland. So this shows that when you look at these debates, you can find out how they made political decisions. And there was were influences that went far beyond the specific case at hand. On the one hand, there were ideologic blocks unable to compromise, so the, the opposition between hereditary and elective monarchy. But there were also pragmatic um, solutions proposed. Everybody could agree to that, but they were difficult to um, get past the ideological principles. In the end, what was decisive were the uh, political necessities of the day, objective of the day, and the necessities when it came to looking at the neighboring powers. So that's it from my part for the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, planned this uh, discussion in the following way. The first uh, round of questions was to give our panelists more time. In the second round, I would like to address my question to all panelists and I would ask them to be a bit more brief. My question will be longer. However, please be short in your answers. Now, let's turn to an area that not all historians enjoy, namely counterfactual history. What if, what if, what would have happened if? We all know that uh, the May the third constitution lasted just over a year. The life of the September constitution wasn't much longer. My question is, what would the life of uh, the constitution have been had it uh, had a chance uh, to last longer would the polish lithuanian multinational and let me emphasize the word multinational commonwealth after the may revolution have gone along the path of growing radicalization like uh, the uh, revolutionary and later expansionistic and imperial france did changing its constitutions every few years, or rather would it follow the American path, more evolutionary in nature to a certain moment at least, although leading to the civil war of 1861-65, uh, or perhaps it would have followed the route of the Habsburg monarchy federalized after 1867. What is your take on that? What would the future of uh, the May constitution have been had it had any future. Well, if I may, as uh, an perhaps not admirer, as admirer would be too much of uh, a word. However, I'm uh, deeply impressed personally with the consensual nature of our political culture of the past. I would say that we would rather follow in the evolutionary uh, direction. The months that have followed when the constitution was fine-tuned, when there was a range of uh, acts of law passed uh, that uh, uh, decided upon the certain things, including uh, the uh, reciprocal guarantee of uh, both uh, nations. Uh, 
seems to me to be more natural. It uh, matches uh, the previous tradition of compromise, finding solutions that are acceptable to the majority. Surely the compromise would have been hard to reach at some points, but I'm of the opinion that if uh, we had lived in this idealized world, if uh, we had not been uh, surrounded by uh, foreign powers that had a totally contrary interest, uh, if uh, the Republic had had a chance uh, to independently shape its future of fate, we would have witnessed evolution rather at least until the 19th century, that is, until the moment of transforming uh, national um, awareness. Um, I cannot uh, speculate about uh, the past so much. The 19th century is the time when a different kind of uh, uh, awareness, a different definition of the nation comes into being. And I don't know what the multinational uh, republic would have looked back then. However, in the panel, in the, in the perspective of a couple of decades, that's the fate of the republic that I would see. Thank you indeed. Well, we shall answer in the order that we uh, had at the beginning of our discussion. I personally would like to invite you to use the Q&A uh, button to ask your own question. In the German version, that's F and A, Fragen und Antworten, Q&A would be the uh, English equivalent. Please type your questions, should you have any. Piotr, what is your perspective, uh, the Polish-French perspective, uh, on the revolution slash evolution of the Republic. Please uh, unmute yourself. Apologies. Well, assuming that uh, the system established on the 3rd of May uh, had lasted, uh, there was no field for radicalization like the case was in France. In France, uh, radicalization resulted from deeply rooted political divisions between the masses, the powers, the milieus uh, that were antagonized, uh, which at the end of the day decided to fight with each other. In the Republic uh, here, I would say, uh, there was a great uh, consent. Let's look at the campaign of February 1791. Uh, um, the government of the nobility accepted almost unanimously the constitution of uh, the 3rd of May. As we are here, of course, we all know that there was some internal op opposition, the Targovica Confederation. However, that was an artificial creation animated by uh, Russia. There were three great magnates or great lords behind it. Uh, however, they were supported uh, by just a handful of uh, their uh, allies. And uh, without foreign support, they would not have been able to radicalize Poland uh, to have a deep rift between the advocates and uh, the opponents of the constitution. Another element um, hampering radicalization was the role of the king in the system. The king was an element of balance, which uh, resembles the British system. The king being a balance between different powers and different institutions within the state and the society. As long as the system lasted, nothing bad would have happened. We all know that uh, there was uh, um, armed Russian interference uh, two years uh, later, uh, the uh, uh, Kostyushka um, insurrection. And back in the days when uh, Tadeusz Kostyushka um, 
actually um, made the king powerless. Uh, he started to be a kind of dictator, the head of the army, even though the history loves him. And his role at that point in time could have resembled the role that was had that had been played by General Bonaparte uh, in the context of radicalization of the French landscape. It seems to me that uh, we would have had bright future, as was uh, predicted by the authors of the constitution. They wrote indeed that changes in the system can happen after 25 uh, years uh, during a special parliamentary session that would have uh, been convened after 25 years so they assumed that their work would have lasted a long time unfortunately that did not materialize thank you very much Carsten. no madam professor dombrovsky what was it like from the american perspective in your view well i admit not being fond of counterfactual questions because we historians uh, uh, who have perfect vision in hindsight uh, can only guess as to alternative scenarios. And here I'm going to repeat what Professor Hoinska Mika's uh, opinion was, because I think also that it would be the American and not the French example that would be taken. Um, for again, we need to recall that both Polish and American drafters of the two respective constitutions had to be pragmatic and realistic, given that it was impossible to get all sides, all parties to agree to everything. And this has come out time and again in the presentations. Um, uh, we just had a talk of Targowice being a problem. But even in the, Pol in the American case, things were not so uh, smooth either. Uh, the 1787 Constitution was actually the second Constitution of the United States uh, after the much weaker Articles of Confederation. So, I mean, you have a different gradation of change uh, taking place. So, I, I think that gives us even more opportunities to, to compare the two situations and think that polls might have made a, a slightly bigger jump at some point, but perhaps they did not. Uh, and again, as uh, Professor Ugniewski just mentioned, it's important to note that uh, change was foreseen in the Polish constitution. Every 25 years, they would call a constitutional same. Uh, it's also important to remember the presentation of Professor Nixentaitis, who underscored the mutual guarantee of both nations, which again shows us how already right after the Constitution was written, corrections and clarifications were being made. So to me, uh, this underscores the fact that these were both framework documents, works in progress with built-in flexibility. Uh, we know that the terminology in both of them was pointedly vague and could be interpreted in various ways. And I, as I believe, with time, both documents could have been perfected. I just want to say one last point, since you, since you raised earlier the interesting issue of slavery and serfdom. Uh, the various countries all had their problems with the slaves and the serfs. Uh, that said, in the Polish constitution, at least the peasants were taken under the protection of the law, while in the United States, it was the Southern states who insisted that the constitution guarantee that fugitive slaves be returned to them. And that wouldn't have changed until many, many decades later. And e even after the abolition of slavery, uh, anyone who follows American current uh, affairs will know that we are still struggling with the legacy of slavery and subsequent discrimination and inequity. So not even the ability to adjust and amend constitutions guarantees a perfect outcome. Dziękuję pani profesor za również podniesienie tego ostatniego wątku. Mogę państwu zdradzić, że w książce Richarda Butterwicka I can tell you uh, that in Richard Butterwick's book this uh, problem is addressed. Uh, to what extent was it effectively solved in the 3rd of May constitution? It seems that it was not. 
However, Professor Butterwick says that the provisions in Article 4 were sufficient uh, to make it so that within one or two generations that the peasant estate uh, could be turned into a free citizenry that would be part of the nation. And in fact, that is how they are defined in Article 4 of the 3rd of May Constitution as the most important, the most profitable um, part of the national society. Uh, Karsten, are you, uh, you're on. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I am rather pessimistic in this question. And looking at the comparison with uh, France and the United States, I would like to point out that the US Constitution was created at the end of a long, bloody, but victorious war. It stood at the end of a process that led to an almost complete exchange of the elites. Elites were new everywhere, and I read somewhere that this exchange was much stronger than during the Russian October Revolution. The opponents of the new system, this is not, not often mentioned, they were almost, everyone was uh, driven out of the country. So the society was very homogenous after a victory. Of course, there were tensions and problems, no question. In the Polish case, however, reminds me more of the French case. You can ask just as well, why did they not keep the French constitution of 1792 and evolve that slowly uh, because of the problem of the war. Radicalization was connected to war. And I think there is nobody in the uh, constitutional debate in Poland uh, who did not uh, think that Poland might uh, be involved in a war. Question was which alliances could be forged, etc. So such a war would be, uh, would have been difficult to go through without trying, like during the Shoshosku um, unrest to mobilize the population, which le would lead to other problems. Uh, some words on the question of the peasants. Yes, one might imagine a revolution, but even what is put down in the May constitution was only possible because there was the massive pressure at the moment. It is hard to imagine that the question of the peasants uh, could just have uh, gone away in an ev evolutionary way. Prussia, uh, uh, who had perhaps the only successful um, uh, agricultural reform in the 19th century, creating a relatively strong um, group of peasants, only did so because they saw no other possibility um, in the face of Napoleon's um, invasion of their country so and there is a question about the what happened uh, during nationalization one has to ask oneself if the, the question of the peasants was resolved it might have had a positive outcome like in france that the other uh, levels of the population all become french citizens citizens, but it did not necessarily happen that way. So either you could have a unification or you could have different groups of the population opposing each other. And this was a problem in Poland. So I think the constitution of the 3rd of May was a possibility. If they had had some kind of ally, they might have um, gone forward with it, but I don't believe in an evolutionary process because the inner tensions and the foreign problems were just too big. You can't compare this with America. 
Uh, thank you very much, Karsten. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A from our audience. Actually, we have more questions. I apologize to Mr. Krause. I would encourage you to ask that question via email uh, because it deserves a more elaborate answer. So I would ask Mr. Thomas uh, to contact me directly via email and we will certainly respond to your question. Uh, there are two uh, more very specific uh, questions, uh, one from Mr. Timotheus Arwan, and I will read it uh, to you in German. It will be translated. So, uh, to what extent were the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, to what extent did, did they influence the 3rd of May Constitution? And the second question is from Arkadius Juravic. Does the Constitution of the 3rd of May have a, a continuity for the future drafts of constitutions in Poland, Lithuania, or other where in Europe? Uh, did the 3rd of May constitution uh, give, um, catalyze other constitutions in the history of Poland and Lithuania? Or um, did the 3rd of May constitution influence uh, constitutional arrangements in other countries? So, Perhaps I might respond to the first question about uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, or I will pass the question on to uh, Piotr Ugniewski. Yes, indeed, uh, the uh, Rousseau's um, remarks on the government of Poland were quite well known. In Poland, in fact, the treatise was written um, at the, um, um, it had been uh, commissioned by the Bar Confederates. So the text was quite well known in Poland. As for the political solutions adopted in the constitution, uh, here Rousseau's influence is less direct certainly not as direct as that of Montesquieu. Nevertheless, we could say that there are certain commonalities with, um, with the purpose that Rousseau had uh, set for the Poles. And in the preamble, um, it was said that we need to um, exploit this extraordinary moment, uh, take the opportunity to break free of um, a foreign dependence, uh, renew the Polish Republic, and uh, try to survive in a hostile environment. And Rousseau expresses the same idea in a famous phrase which, uh, in which he calls upon the Poles uh, not to uh, let the Russians swallow them up. However, if that were to happen, uh, don't let the don't let the Russians digest you. So don't let them swallow. Don't let them digest. And let your attachment uh, to the Commonwealth be stronger than um, the state structure, which could collapse. And in my view, uh, the Commonwealth, as a mental idea, uh, did survive. So in that sense. The 3rd of May Constitution has a similar structure or is based on similar premises as the thought of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, although there are many 
points of divergence. For instance, uh, Rousseau's call to equality was not um, implemented in the Polish constitution because at that point in time, that postulate could not be fulfilled. Even though Rousseau's um, ideas were much more moderate um, there in that treatise than in the social contract. He was indeed trying to uh, develop a realistic account of Poland when writing down his remarks. He also believed that there was a kind of civic spirit among the Polish nobility, which is really a force, um, really um, an important force uh, in a situation of danger. After the death of Rousseau and after the French Revolution and the, the events in Poland, um, history showed that this was a very important factor at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries. So in that sense, Rousseau's um, forecast was quite right, but not regarding the constitution. Um, panelists, we still have the question from uh, Mr. Juravich about the influence exerted by the 3rd of May constitution on other constitutional laws. Uh, I think it's important that in 1807, we have the constitution of the Duchy of Warsaw, which was really a mix, a kind of mishmash uh, based on the French constitutions, but also inspired by the 3rd of May constitution, Piotr. All right, um, I'll answer that one as well. We have a theme emerging here that our uh, German friend uh, mentioned, um, the Polish-Saxon personal union. Because under the constitution, or rather under um, Napoleon's decision, uh, Friedrich um, August III, the Saxon elector, became uh, the ruler of the duchy, who we encountered earlier in the context of um, Poland's hereditary throne. Uh, but here, um, you, you pointed to Karsten. The 1807 constitution was influenced by the 1791 constitution and its architects. And uh, to a large extent, it was actually drafted in Dresden, Karsten. Um, so, yes, well, on the one hand, it is uh, in the tradition of the Saxon monarchy that is continued. There are also some other aspects. The rights of the non-noble citizens are strengthened, but many elements are kept that were written down in the Constitution of May regarding elections. But what is entirely different is the Napoleonian branch of the Constitution of the Grand Duchy of, of Warsaw. There is no self-government. And there is, so the Legislative Assembly may assemble and say yes or no, but it cannot really um, in, be involved in legislation. This is the decisive difference. So regarding the formal aspects, the constitution of the Duchy of Warsaw is has many ties with the constitution of May 1791, but the 
key content is a Napoleonian product. I wanted to say one or two sentences about Rousseau. What's interesting is that all parties in there, all parties could refer to Rousseau, never mind how controversial their positions were. And the second is, yes, the influence of Rousseau is very clear in the act on the cities, on the towns, where the, it is about an evolutionary nobilitation of society, which is a very special idea. And that is part of the draft that Rousseau made for a Polish constitution. And this is an idea that was decided on very uh, on very short notice during the same, and everybody agreed. And I think it has to do with the fact that everybody knew about that. They knew Rousseau, and so they agreed. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may, can, could I add something? Of course, uh, even though we are running out of time. Uh, well, I wouldn't actually look for a link uh, with the constitution of the Duchy of Warsaw. Indeed, the con conditions and circumstances were much different. Uh, the constitution of the 3rd of May was an act of the political nation in this brief period of political sovereignty that's vital. There was no person like Napoleon who would um, decide about the state of affairs. When we talk about the constitution of the 3rd of May, the situation in Europe changed so quickly, and it was so quickly that uh, the uh, interference occurred that referring directly to the constitution would be a bit anachronic. However, what uh, contemporary uh, scholars uh, emphasize is that it was a point of reference uh, for polls. That's why we're talking about it uh, right now. Uh, it wasn't because it was so brief, but it was uh, a fact that the Polish elites, uh, Potocki, Stanisław August Poniatowski, and the, 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 the mixed political nation was able to strike a deal, was able to compromise, to give up, to sacrifice uh, some political uh, rights, as was, for instance, the case with the noblemen who did not own any property. Let's remember that in the second half of the 18th century, it was um, an element that made the system anach anachronic uh, and not constructive. So if I was to look for uh, the value of constitution for Poland and Poland and Lithuania, where our nations, uh, because all in all, we are not only talking about uh, Poland and Lithuania, but also contemporary Ukraine, which is also um, rooted in these traditions. Uh, the multinationality, the common uh, um, sky that you, Igor, wrote about uh, back in the days. Uh, as a result of it all, it makes this a huge symbol for our political awareness and the fact uh, that Young Gil's concert in uh, uh, appears uh, in Pan uh, Tadeusz, uh, the one of the opus magnum of the Polish literature. That's where the power of a constitution uh, lies. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have to but come to an end. I don't feel like ending this discussion myself, but uh, our interpreters are constantly under pressure and have been working for almost two hours now, must be tired. That is why we wanted first and foremost to thank them to thank the interpreters, they allowed us uh, to have a multilingual debate. So a big thank you to the interpreters and the interpreters would like to thank you all for listening to us. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank you on behalf of Beth Carvin from uh, the Polish Institute. Uh, the Leipzig uh, branch, who is the co-organizer of today's uh, event. Uh, 
I would also like to thank you in his name. Uh, the big thank you goes to uh, the panelists and to the listeners. The panelists gave us a multitude of perspectives uh, to look at an event that might seem to be very polished in nature. I think that in our today's debate, we managed to identify certain lines or directions that run uh, closer to placing the constitution of uh, 1791 uh, uh, in the broader context of the history of Europe and contemporary uh, history uh, in general. What uh, Professor Hoinska uh, stressed is that uh, the constitution was a certain compromise. It was the art of reaching a consent among conflicted parties. In the, within the political nation. I think indeed this is a, a vital idea that uh, stems from the constitution of the 3rd of uh, May. And uh, right now, this is my sincere wish to all of us in Poland and outside of the Polish borders. I hope that we will all be able to talk to each other and to find compromise. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank our guests, our listeners for being with us so long. And once again, a very big thank you to the interpreters. And I hope to see you next time during our next uh, debate uh, devoted again to the Constitution of the 3rd of May. Have a safe and good evening. Stay healthy. Thank you.